Welcome everyone to What the Force and welcome to a new episode of The Way of the Force. And this is going to be our special deep dive into Alan Watts. And it's probably going to be a couple of episodes long eventually. So kind of like meta music, we're going to be digging into Zen Buddhism, uh, talking about a whole bunch of different subjects within that. And hopefully you will come along with us for the ride to really deep dive into the force from a perspective of Alan Watts. And to join me is one of the smartest people I know. Oh, God. Josh Johnson. <laughs> Welcome back. Thanks. How you doing, MC? I have missed you. Oh, thank you. I've missed you too. <laughs> Everything is kind of crazy right now. So let's yeah. get a little zen with it. There we go. That's yeah. a good way to handle that, right? Yeah. We're going to dig into Alan Watson. And my perspective is, and I'm I'm very selfish in doing this personally, so, so accept my selfishness and wanting to talk about it. But uh -huh. I have listened to tons of lectures, especially on YouTube. There's tons available. But it's kind of hard to know where to begin with Alan Watts because it's almost like a giant big cycle and circle that he ends up talking exactly. in. Mm -hmm. But I was actually recommended, so just over a year ago from when we when we're recording this, I was at Celebration and I happened to run into Claudia Gray having lunch and I imposed on her and <laughs> asked her, how do I understand the force better? And that kind of kicked off my own little journey where I was going to deep dive into the force specifically. But she recommended that I listen to Alan Watts and read the Tao Te Ching. That was that her one. recommendation. And she had just released Master and Apprentice, so had been thinking about it specifically during that period of time. And it's absolutely the best suggestion if you want to try to understand the force and the influences really on the force, especially creators. So who was this Alan Watts guy? <laughs> Alan always, what I love about him is he always in his lectures said he was a spiritual entertainer. He would uh, rail against anyone that uh, or railed against the idea that he was a guru, which a lot of people even today, like when his name comes up, they might think of him that way. Um, but he was he was he was a spiritual entertainer. He used to compare himself to he would say and he has said it in lectures. Uh, it's going and listening to him talk. He said people should consider it no different than if you were to go listen to uh, a, a pianist, right? Mm -hmm. And they play Bach or Beethoven. He said, I'm not trying to convert anybody to anything. I'm not trying to tell you this is how it is. This is when I'm up here talking about uh, what I talk about. And he always talked about, uh, you know, Zen Buddhism and um, Eastern philosophy and Western philosophy too. This is the thing a lot of people forget. Um, but he said, when I'm up here doing that, he said, think of me as nothing other than a pianist who's playing Bach and Beethoven and different composers they love. And the music, if the music touches you in a certain way and does something and like, great. If not, then it's just been two hours of your life. And you know, you don't like Bach or Beethoven, you know, like that's how he always, it's really cool. Cause that's how he always talked about it. And it, that uh, he saw himself as a spiritual entertainer. And that's and, very much like Star Wars, right? Where it has mm -hmm. this combination of all of these different philosophies of thought and spiritual sacred stories and, you know, schools that allowed us to put into perspective. And much like mythology, it is just a lens by which we use to view ourselves as humanity. Right. So it's a good place to start, especially if you are maybe not particularly familiar with especially Eastern philosophies. Exactly. And I think you've said, and I know it's pretty much how I got into Alan years and years ago. Um, you just, <laughs> well, here we go. We're talking about Alan Watts. It's like the ocean. You just have to jump in. Like, yeah. right. And there's, there's really no, there's really nothing you can um, latch onto and say, Oh, you start with this book, right. Or you start with this audio recording. You know, and, and people can give you those, their favorites or whatever, or ones that seem like they might be a little more um, easily interpreted your first time in, right? Mm -hmm. As much the same way you might say, oh, yeah, if you're going to start surfing, probably shouldn't start on the North Shore of Oahu, right? Yeah. You're going to get killed or beat up. And so, <laughs> uh, you know, there are <laughs> there are guidelines maybe, but even at that, 
um, you just, with Alan Watts, you just kind of have to jump in and he is, I don't know. I, it's funny on Twitter, we have a lot of friends and mutuals that love Alan Watts and his voice is a lot of people consider the way he talks and his voice soothing. I don't like necessarily like think about it like that, but he is, he is interesting to listen to. I always, you know, have him on my iPod and Mm -hmm. um, more often than not, if I'm out walking the dog, the desert or something, I'm usually at least listening to him for 20, 30 minutes at mo you know, at, at a time. But, um, it is, you just kind of have to jump in with him. There's no, no place to, to begin, I guess. All right. Let's listen to a bit of Alan Watts. This clip runs about five minutes. The truth is the middle way. Neither sukha nor dukkha, neither atman nor anatman, self nor non-self. The uh, whole point is uh, like this. Once when R.H. Blythe was asked by some students, do you believe in God? He answered, if you do, I don't. If you don't, I do. And so in the much the same way, all Buddhist uh, pedagogics teaching is specifically addressed, not to people in general, but to the individual who brings a problem. And wherever he seems to be overemphasizing things in one way, the teacher overemphasizes in the opposite way, so as to arrive at the middle way. So then, with this emphasis on life is suffering, uh, it's simply saying, this is the problem we're dealing with. We hurt. We human beings feel pretty unfairly treated because we are born into a world so arranged that the price that we pay for enjoying it, that is to say, for having sensitive bodies, is that these bodies are at the same time, because they are sensitive, capable of the most excruciating agonies. Isn't that a nasty trick to play on us? What are we going to do about it? This is the problem. So then when the Buddha says, the cause of suffering is desire, Trishna uh, is our word thirst, and may perhaps be translated desire in a very general sense, or perhaps better, craving, clinging, grasping, something like that. He is saying, now, uh, I'm going to make this suggestion. You suffer because you desire. Now, supposing then you try not to desire, and see if by not desiring you can cease from suffering. Or you can put the same thing in another way. You can say to a person, it's all in your mind. There is nothing either good or ill, but thinking makes it so. And therefore, if you can control your mind, you've nothing else that you need control. For example, uh, you don't need to control uh, the rain if you can control your mind. If you get wet, it's only your mind that makes you think it's uncomfortable to be wet. A person who's got good mental discipline can be perfectly happy wandering around in the rain. You don't need a fire if you've got good mind control, uh, because if you've got uh, ordinary bad mind control, when it gets cold, you start shivering. That's because you are putting up a resistance to the cold. You're fighting. But don't fight it. Relax to the cold. And uh, in other words, this is a matter of mental attitude, and then you'll be fine. Always control your mind. This is another way of approaching it, you see. Now then, as soon as the student begins to experiment with these things, he finds out that it's not so easy as it sounds. Not only is it very difficult not to desire, not only is it very difficult to control your mind, but there's something phony about the whole business. And this is what you're intended to discover. That namely, when you try to eliminate desire in order to escape from suffering, You desire to escape from suffering. You are desiring not to desire. In other words, I'm not merely playing with logic. I'm saying that a person who is escaping from reality will always feel the terror of it. It'll be like the hound of heaven that pursues him. And he's escaping in a way even when he's trying not to escape. And it was this point, you see, that this method of teaching was supposed to educate from you, to draw out from you, not by saying to anybody all this in the first place, but by making the experiment, 
not to desire, or the experiment to control your mind thoroughly, this is the first step. You, to understand this, you must go through that, or some equivalent of it, so as to come to the point where you see you are involved in a vicious circle, that in trying to control your mind, the motivation, the reason for which you are doing it, is still clinging and grasping. There is still self-protection. There is still lack of trust and love. So, when this is understood, the student returns to the teacher and says, look, this is my difficulty. I cannot eliminate desire because that itself, my effort to do so, is itself desire. I cannot eliminate selfishness because my reasons for wanting to be unselfish are selfish. As one of the Chinese uh, Buddhist classics puts it, when the wrong man uses the right means, the right means work in the wrong way. Now, the right means are all the traditional disciplines. And you're going to use them, you see. You're going to practice zazen or whatever and uh, make yourself into a Buddha. But, you see, if you're not a Buddha in the first place, you can't become one because you'll be the wrong man. And that was Alan Watts and some of what he has had to say, as you can hear how he talks and how he kind of comes around in circles to the different pieces of the conversation. But who was he as a person? Born in 19, 1915, died in 73. So he uh, was born in London, England, um, grew up there, moved to America and when he was in his 20s, I want to say. And then he was an Episcopal priest at one oh. point. Mm -hmm. this, see, this is the thing most people don't realize about him that's really interesting. He went to school and got his master's degree in theology at one point. Um, was married three or four times. I, I can't yeah. remember. <laughs> I, I don't know. I have seen friends of ours on Twitter that say for, you know, the 60s, a man, he was good looking. I don't. I don't really, you know, Alan's Alan, like, <laughs> um, like, I guess he's a good looking guy. I don't really know. Um, three times, according to Wikipedia. Yeah, three times. Okay. Yeah. And uh, he, he left the church, the Episcopal, the Episcopal church at one point, um, because he couldn't, he had trouble reconciling um, what he thought as far as Eastern philosophy goes, and his his, I don't want to say, well, at the time, I guess it would be his beliefs um, in Christianity. But anyway, he left, uh, he quit being an Episcopal priest in like 45 or 50, moved to California. And that's where he really shot off as far as like popular Alan Watts, right? Um, mm -hmm. Was his time in California, he became an American citizen um, and settled down with his wife and then became friends and had not, but at that, that time he had already known even when he was back in um, England, he had known uh, Zen Buddhists and uh, Zen masters and never took really any formal training. One of the people that kind of steered me towards Alan Watts was a poet, Gary uh, Snyder, and him and Jim Harrison, the guy who wrote Legends of the Fall. Gary Snyder was big into Zen Buddhism, but he had formally trained and gone over, uh, I believe, to Japan. I think it was. And Alan had, you know, visited the Far East many times and, and done all that and knew a lot of those people. He just had never done any formal training, you know, like mm -hmm. in the traditional sense with that. But by the end of it, um, I believe the day he died, he was actually with a very famous, uh, or the day before was with um, a very famous Zen master. If I, if I remember correctly, I could be wrong on that, but like a few, I know he was a few days before he died in 73. But anyway, um, as far as star Wars goes, I would say his time in California in the fifties and sixties, when he was giving lectures, he had a weekly radio program for a while for mm -hmm. like 30 minutes. He would, uh, you know, kind of tailor his, uh, lectures down to 30 minutes because like me, he had uh, a way of rambling and <laughs> he, he made sense. Right. And he, he, but he did like, he did talk a lot. Like you said, he talked a lot in circles, right. Yeah. But it always had a purpose, yeah. right? Like it always had a purpose. And you can tell even, even if he didn't know it, right. 
it ended up having a purpose. And it's funny because you can listen to some of his stuff and you can tell in his head, he's going, okay, I got here. Oh, but yes, remember, you know, and it's like, you yeah. can, he was great at storytelling. I think is one of the reasons I, I love listening to him. You know, he's talking about some interesting stuff, but he's always got a great story behind it. And to that end, he was also friends uh, with a friend of yours, a young man by the name of Joseph Campbell. <laughs> he's my um, friend now. <laughs> 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 uh, but him and Campbell met, I forget at one point, I forget the year I had known for a while because I thought it was something I had tied to it that was interesting. But anyway, um, but him and Campbell met and hung out quite a bit. And he's even quoted in one of Campbell's Mask of God series as the end, like to the kind of the whole. Was it uh, creative mythology? I think it was. I think it was at yeah. the end. And I tried to find it and it could have been a, another one. It, Mm-hmm. But I know it was creative mythology. Anyway, um, and Campbell, when Campbell taught at, uh, when he was, wasn't he a professor at a, a woman's college for a while? Am I right on that, Joseph I Campbell? I believe so. And, but he, when Campbell taught, I know one of the, because um, I remember one of Campbell's books I was reading, he talks about. When he was a professor at Sarah Lawrence, he was teaching and he actually also integrated a lot of the thoughts of his students during that period of time. Mm -hmm. So his later works are more feminine focused. Yeah, that's it tends to happen when you hang out with the other half for a while. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But he was he was so Alan was friends with Campbell and they appeared in each other's works and talks and uh if people are interested, um, I know people who listen to your show are obviously interested in Campbell. And Alan Watts has a really cool uh, lecture. Well, it's part of his radio program, so it's a 30-minute uh, radio show. But he uh, talks about, he gets really excited. It's funny. He gets really excited about this paper that Joseph Campbell recently introduced. And he's, you know, throughout his life, he always, of course, still had his British accent. And They were mutuals. <laughs> yeah, right? They were mutes. And um, <laughs> yeah, but he, he has a, a very interesting radio 30-minute segment where he talks about Joseph Campbell's paper that Campbell integrated into some of his books later on. And I think it's called The Return to the Forest. It's really interesting. Mm. Alan was Alan. Alan was... Um, a big influence on a lot of people. It's interesting to me. Like I said, I found Alan Watts back in college and came to him through um, poetry and one of my favorite authors. And they were always with, uh, when uh, Gary Snyder and Jim Harrison were talking, there's some cool interviews with them together. And they ended up always talking about Alan Watts and his influence on them and his influence. Alan is credited with interpreting and bringing Eastern philosophy to a Western audience, you know, it's what he's known for, especially in California. In oh, this 50- is one of my favorite. This is the the Return to the Forest has one of my mm-hmm. favorite Campbell quotes. Oh, really? Yeah, it does. So, uh, you enter the forest at the darkest point, where is, there is no path. Where there is a way or a path, it is somebody else's path. You are not on your own path. If you follow somebody else's way, you are not going to realize your potential. (laughs) That's cool. That's cool. That's really. Yeah, because when when Watts is talking about it, um, he's talking about how he really loved that. At the time, it was a paper, right? Like Campbell had, you know, um, I don't want to say really had published it as like an academic paper is Alan Watts starts out talking about as how he talks about it. And, but he talks about it in terms of, cause he, Watts also talked a lot about mythology, right? Like mm-hmm. in, in general, and he would always bring up Campbell and how Campbell, um, you know, had said, we don't have an, a myth, like we need to update our mythology, you know, and mm-hmm. this type of thing. And then a young man in California and Modesto in the fifties and sixties by the name of George Lucas was probably like, you know, I, he, I mean, he was influenced, right? Because he was already getting into all of this stuff with the humanities things that he was interested in. Right. Like, and here's yeah. the thing, like I cannot find, and to be honest, I haven't looked at hard specifically for this. Like I've, I have the, uh, who is it? The Witzner books. I always forget the guy's name. Mm-hmm. The, the making of uh, Star Wars, Return of the Jedi. It's the guy that wrote the, the really good books about 
the original trilogy and the making of them and the history, like where Lucas came up with his ideas at the time and da, 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 da in there. Those are kind of like the, um, I don't want to say that the, but those are kind of where you should go. If you're like really looking to get source material type of stuff. Um, and in there, I know, uh, he talks about influences on Lucas and like you were saying, you know, of course, Campbell comes up all the time and da da da. I can't find any direct quote or anything where George says, of course, Alan Watts influenced Star Wars, but it is very hard to believe that, especially for a kid growing up in California in the fifties and sixties. I mean, it would be like somebody nowadays not knowing about McDonald's if you lived in the United States. Yeah. You know, I mean, seriously, like Alan Watts, especially in California, especially at that time, right? He was everywhere in his, even if, even if you didn't know uh, what you were listening to or what people were talking about, if you were listening to things about Eastern philosophy, like more than likely it was influenced or came about because of Alan Watts and his influence at the time, you know, it's, not that it's really funny because people say that their philosophies on life are very similar, but they don't say that they influenced each other. But I think uh, we can, we can kind of assume that the general culture and the collective unconscious uh, of exactly. California at this time was influencing George Lucas, especially as he sought out kind of these, you know, Eastern philosophies. And I don't know mm -hmm. that without the popularization of Alan Watts in California that we would have gotten so much of a Eastern philosophy influence, like, you know, incepted into his brain. Right. Even though he, you know, because uh, there was a lot of import of Eastern film, Eastern ideas at that time. And it was kind of all part of that same conversation. We're talking about kurosawa right like yeah. i mean so yeah you know, it's got like it's it's not a it's not a big leap at all and i do know um was it uh gary kurtz yes yeah kurtz. he was a so zen, buddhist. zen buddhist right yeah and, and so so was billy um billy d williams and they would yeah. talk about it yeah yeah and i've heard them talk about alan watts a lot and seen things where they talk about him so it makes a lot of sense and it like if you really want to look at it we might talk about this a little bit later but um when people say, and it's one of the, of course, many things I love about um, the man, Ryan Johnson, when he brought Yoda back in The Last Jedi, he brought Yoda back, the Yoda that I remember as a kid, right? From Empire yeah. Strikes Back, which most people refer to as like the hippie Yoda, right? Uh, yeah, the, the, the laughing Buddha Yoda. Exactly, right? And the that's laughing exactly Buddha Yoda. <laughs> And that's very important because that's exactly where that comes from. That is very Zen master, like joking yeah. and right and making jokes. Like Alan Watts talks a lot about how Zen masters um, he uses the idea of of jokes, like as a as an analogy to how Zen masters teach. Right? He said it may not be funny or a joke, but it's the same type of thing. Right? So like, can we get annoyed at sorry. Forrest Ghost Luke since he's all jokey? Mm hmm. Yeah. We can't. What? Do you mean? What? what? <laughs> he Force makes Coast a joke, movie. like from Tross, right? Because he's. Mad. Oh, I don't understand. I don't know what movie you're talking about. <laughs> but he catches the lightsabers like I should. I should be more careful. It's he's joking, right? He's more you're like joking, right. He's he's more like Mark Hamill. He's got the dad yeah. humor. I I will reconcile that piece if that is the direction that they Sorry, were going you do, for. You do you, MC. <laughs> <laughs> I will I will become more forgiving of that if that's what they were yeah, I mean, going for. Yeah. <laughs> like you got you gotta do what you gotta do, right? You gotta make it make sense somehow. <laughs> <laughs> it fits, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, right? Like all of us that know oh, never mind. <laughs> Sorry, I derailed you. All right, no, joking no, no, Buddha, laughing Buddha Yoda. Yeah. No, I was just saying, like, I'm just saying, like, Alan, Alan's influence, I think, can be seen a lot, right? And and not um, – the other thing I don't want to do is make it sound like w none of us would know about Eastern philosophy or Buddhism if it weren't for Alan Watts. Because there were – honestly, there were people that came before him that are just as well-known in certain circles – for having done what he did 
in other ways, I think Alan Watts is probably the one who popularized and brought Zen and Buddhist uh, philosophy and Eastern philosophy to a general audience, right? Like there were academics that had translated um, the I Ching and, and various things that are well known, very well known for doing things like that. But in terms of the general populace and especially at, in the sixties and everything that the sixties meant in terms of uh, cultural change, Alan Watts was a very, very big part of that. So he was a, he was a big influence on a lot of people and a lot of ideas. And as evidenced by what you just said with Claudia Gray, um, yep. it, it, he is a very easy, interesting, um, way to try and understand the force a little bit better. If mm-hmm. you, you know, if you really want to, like, if you want to dig into it and go, okay, so what might this be saying? What might it be coming from, you know, how might it show up again? Yeah. Da, da, da. Instead of thinking about it in terms of something as, you know, the force just as something that Lucas created as, you know, building his world, you're obviously going to pull from things and it's very easy to see Eastern philosophy's influence on the force. Well, and especially as we're going kind of into the next phase of storytelling, we're going to get more of this philosophical version of the force. So what is the force truthfully? And then through a, you know, societal construct of the Jedi, we're going to get that in the Mm -hmm. High Republic period of time. And so it's really interesting to be like, okay, what is the force doing? And then what is what is the Jedi saying the force should do? So because all, you know, cultural constructs of religion and organized religion put a framework around, you know, the spiritualism that is inherent in humanity. Mm -hmm. And because it's actually speaking to our psychology as humans rather than, you know, but then there's that cultural and constructed organization that helps us support, uplift, or use it, but it also aligns to the culture that it exists in. So the Jedi are there to support the culture that exists, but the Force still exists in this galaxy far, far away. Yeah. So to me, it's really, really interesting to like kind of dig into, you know, the fact that, yes, a, a direct connection to what is the energy of the universe exists in this galaxy far, far away, but then there's a social construct around it. So what does Mm -hmm. that do and how does that change how people work with or access or talk about? And we will see that play out, I believe in the high Republic, which is cool. Exactly. Very (laughs) cool. Yeah, no, you're right. It's, it is, that's interesting, but that is, yeah. (laughs) No, cause I like, I don't want to. Yeah. All right. So, in base, we need to talk about flow. Okay. Do you have 16 hours? Couple no. Of- <laughs> but maybe, maybe over the course of this whole Alan Watts deep dive, this is just part one, we can always do more. <laughs> okay. I guess the best way to start to talk about it for me in terms of the force, in terms of chronologically speaking, I guess, like, when Obi, you know, in, in in A New Hope, when Obi Wan is telling Luke what the Force is, and then in Empire, when you know Yoda has his famous, mm-hmm. it's it's here, it's all around us, it's it's, it's the rock, it's the, field right, that exactly, ties right, the universe mm-hmm. together. So this energy field, you could think of it, and this is what Alan talks about with the. Um, like the energy of the world. Cause he's like, he talks about it in terms of everyday life in terms of you as a human interacting just with the world. Right. And he was very, Alan was very big on man and nature. He later on in life uh, really got into um, in the late sixties, you know, the, the uh, movements uh, in, at the time of um, the uh, what am I trying to say? the eco movements, right? Like, um, and he was very big on, on talking about man's interaction with the earth. Right. And in particular, just nature. Um, he was famous 
for uh, a really cool analogy quote that I always loved where he said, you know, as man, our myths, our uh, Western religions have taught us to confront nature, right? We, we have to dominate it. And in Eastern philosophy, you become one with it, right? Mm. You, you flow with it. You think of it. He always talked about it uh, in terms of uh, a mountain stream, right? Which, you know, if you think about the force, it really plays <laughs> into uh, you don't, the minute you start trying to swim upstream and control the flow of the water, the flow of the river, yeah, things are going to go sideways real quick for you, you know, Anakin. Um, but if you are able to sit in the stream, if you're able to realize that either when you're in it or on it, on a surfboard, in a boat, Alan was big on sailing, um, mm -hmm. that you should really like, you don't need to just sit and let it take you wherever it wants to, right? Like uh, he was often fond of saying, you can use a rudder, right? But a rudder doesn't try and control the river. A rudder just is still moving with it. It's still moving with the stream. And whatever you uh, use as a rudder, you've constructed that on your own. And if you use it correctly, like you can flow with the river, right? As opposed to trying to take a power boat up river, right? If that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and so he, he had talked about, um, he had talked about it in terms of flowing water. There's a lot of uh, quotes that do this with Zen um, and streams of consciousness, right? This was the big thing, okay? So with, uh, with meditation, and if anybody does, like I always do the Headspace app, right? Or different mindful meditation is a big thing now, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But it it's a it's a idea of being present, right? It's an idea of like Qui Gon used to say to Obi Wan, like you need to find your center, like just exist. Be mindful out. of the living force, which is in the moment, is the right. here and now. Yeah, that's a huge concept, right? It's a huge concept with Zen. It's um, it's the idea that, like I was saying, it, it, in terms of water, whether it's waves in the ocean, um, you can't control those. So you have to learn how to surf them. You have to learn how to uh, just exist in that moment and ride it out. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if we're talking about flow, there's a lot of different, a lot of different ways you could, you could talk about it with the force. Okay. Sorry. I'm like, um, don't apologize. No, let's let's so let's separate it kind of in terms of how Filoni might talk about it uh, with um, this, this will help. It, let's separate it in terms of how Filoni might talk about it in terms of an athlete and, uh, a creator mm -hmm, in he'll, terms, he'll get into that too, with in, that. into a groove, right? Like, mm -hmm. and people do this all the time, whether you're, uh, you hear all the time about, uh, authors that will sit down and they'll, you know, they'll say like, how did you write this great book or this story? You know, and the, a lot of times you hear things like, you know, I, I sat down and of course I had ideas in my head. I sat down. And I don't remember it, you know, like six hours later, I was done. You know, I was in the groove. Mm -hmm. You'll hear athletes have a really good game and they're like, oh, I was, you know, I don't know. I was in the groove, right? I just kept, I just kept, you know, chunking threes and they kept falling. I kept, you know, aiming at the net in hockey and it kept going in. I kept, you know, catching the ball in football, whatever it might be, like you're in the groove, right? And that's something that's been studied that, um, that uh, a guy whose last name, um, Mihai Chi Sik Mihai, and that's literally how you pronounce it. It's long. Um, but he's, he's, a, uh, he's been around since like the 60s or 70s. And he's done research in, on what he calls the flow state. And it's very much the concept of the groove in sports and whatnot. And there's a lot of interesting books about it. Um, one of the ones, the one that I came to the flow state on in terms of the flow, uh, a book called West of Jesus about surfing. And there's different, uh, different athletes that this guy has studied. And um, nowadays they've hooked them up to different MRI machines and whatnot. 
but your brain will literally, when you are doing something usually physical, right? Um, Mm -hmm. That's most of what they've studied. Uh, What they're starting to get into now are the, um, they're starting to hook people up and and do things like writing and creative uh, aspects that don't necessarily deal with sports or, you know, strenuous physical activity. But um, surfing is a big one because people oftentimes will talk about becoming one with the wave, right? Mm -hmm. And that you feel like, you literally will feel like you are a part of it. Like there's no different. It's very hard to talk about. Michelangelo from a creative perspective was quoted as saying like he never created the statues. He was just, they were always in it. He was taking away the excess marble because it was always there. He always knew what was in there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the marble itself knew what it was. What it was. What it wanted to be. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Which is just like, what? Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I think that that's just like a very interesting way to be like, okay, with with athletes specifically, they practice so much that it ends up going into their short twitch muscles. And it's like muscle memory in some ways, but there's a there's a state by which their mind doesn't get in the way. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's part of the flow, which is that right. Their mind is almost allowing their body just to do what it needs to do. To take over. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And they've actually found in this guy's uh, work, Mihai Chi Sik Mihai, on the flow state. That's what he's termed it as, like academic language. You know, if you were to um, look it up, like he coined the phrase. And, um, but that, you're, th- th- that your brain literally does that, that they have found that in terms of your, um, your brain the way it's wired that when you are in the flow state, when you hear surfers talk about, I was, I just felt like I was part of the wave, your brain, they've, they've hooked people up and they found out that, well, of course you did because your brain thought you were right. Yeah. Mountain climbers feel the same way. Like you, you'll hear a lot of times like mountain climbers that, you know, go up El Cap or whatever, and they get to a certain point and they say, you know, I just felt like I was one with the mountain. I was one with the rock face. Well, in terms of what they found on this research on flow state, in all actuality, you were, right? Your brain literally thought you were. Like it it shut down to a point and let your body take over and wired a certain was wired a certain way and certain, you know, prefrontal cortex or whatever, different parts of it were lighting up that told that your brain literally was just like, okay, yeah, we're just do we're doing this. And um, we're we're just in the flow state. Things are just going to happen now because we're just going to go with it. And so it's interesting that in terms of the force that you get this idea of the force. I don't I don't know is taking over the right word. Like you know, just in general, Revenge of the Sith is like the best force book from like yeah. a from like a conversational perspective when you want to talk about you know it in how it views and talks about both the light side and the dark side of the force and kind of um what it is to exist as it being part of the force um like so this is actually um on the bridge of the ship at the beginning when Anakin and Obi-Wan are fighting Grievous mm-hmm. um Obi-Wan is is connecting heavily with the Force and he's like, he doesn't even need to reach into the Force. He has already let the Force reach into him. The Force flows over him, around him, as though he has stepped into a crystal pure waterfall, lost in the green coils of the forgotten rainforest. When he opens himself into that sparkling stream, it flows into him and through him and out again as though there isn't the slightest interference from his conscious will. That part that calls or uh, that part of him that calls itself Obi-Wan Kenobi is no more than a ripple, an eddy in the pool into which he endlessly pours. No, that's perfect. Yes. <laughs> no, that's perfect. And the guy, what's the guy's um what's the guy's name that wrote the book? I always forget. Matthew Stover. Yes. So did you know, and this makes perfect sense, that Stover uh, was very big into martial arts. And so I'm sure he knows all about the flow state, yeah. honestly, like as, in terms of athletic 
you know, right. Like I had read something once where I had read, he was very, he like some, something crazy combined. I forget how many different styles of martial arts he's credited with combining into this one form that he uses, but in revenge of the Sith, there's parts too that talk about that go with this flow state idea in the force is flow. The force is like a stream. The force is something that, Mm -hmm. um, that seeps into you that went in there when you were saying in that quote, it's awesome when it says the part of him that was Obi-Wan ceased to exist or something. Yeah. It was just an eddy, like a ripple. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like that's so, um, that's so Buddhist and, and Zen and like, right. When you are in the moment, when you, when you have no thought for the future or the past, right. When you're Mm -hmm. just there, you're just there. Right. And I know I repeated that twice, but like, you're just there. You're not, you're not letting your thoughts get in the way, right. You're not blocking. Um, Alan Watts talks about like, in terms of like, your thoughts aren't blocking anything, right. That, that you as a human in that moment should be doing, you're just allowing yourself to be taken over by whatever that thing is. Right. And for star Wars fans and star Wars, it's the force, right? Like yeah. you're just, you're just there. And, like Qui Gon always, you you find your center. You, um, you know, are mindful of the living force. Exactly. Yeah, which right, is everything right. that's happening around you. You you exist in the now, and then, um, like what's really interesting is that it's also paired in contrast with what Anakin is going through, which he describes as like kind of the shadow within himself throughout the novel as a a, a dragon, right? So. Uh, there is a dragon that exists at the heart of Anakin Skywalker, and it is a dragon that exists at the center of a cold, dead star. Yeah, wanting wanting to ignite, and because there's this like whole mythos around Tatooine having uh, dragons that in the twin suns. So there's all this like dragon mythology that's like underneath the surface that hasn't really officially been brought up to the layers, but I love it. <laughs> yeah. Because like That's the cool. dragon itself is, is uncontrollable nature, right? It is in itself a form of a wave or, you know, mm-hmm. the na- the natural, natural way of being. And what ends up happening is he's trying to squish the, the dragon Right. He's trying to suppress mm-hmm. the dragon and then the dragon ends up coming out and um, killing and being terrible. <laughs> yeah. And that I mean, that go that makes sense. That goes with that goes with to me when you say that I'm just re- like reminded of all the times Alan Watts talks about, uh, you know, Western philosophy is very different from Eastern philosophy and in, in, uh, especially in terms of man's interaction with nature right and if the dragon represents nature like you were saying then confronting it right like trying to to control it rather than trying to understand it and trying to exist with it right and that's where alan later on in life got very big into like even back in the 60s was jumping up and down in a lot of his later lectures talking about how why are we still using gas powered motors and why are we, you know, using coal plants and things to power our electricity when we could be doing it with windmills and different things. And he would use those analogies in terms of talking about our existence with nature and a more, uh, a more Zen Zen type way of doing it. Right. Yeah. He always would talk about going back to like sailing. He's big on sailing. And I, I know I've seen this before and I, I, have never sailed and don't, but he talks a lot about um, something called you know, somebody's listening that knows sailing um, tacking where you, you can literally go against the wind with a sail, but you have to know how to do it. Right. Yeah. And he, he, but he uses that as an analogy to describe again, like the energy of the universe. There's ways that you can, if you exist with it, you can, you can do what to a normal person would look like you're controlling it, but you're not because right. you can't. Right. That, and so that, that reminds me a lot of the legends of Luke Skywalker story. Yes. Fishing in the deluge by Ken Liu. <laughs> mm-hmm. Cause, 
Because like that's the philosophical argument that ends up happening over the course of that story, which is that this culture uh, calls the force the tide and their whole Mm -hmm. idea is to exist within the tide and to accept the, you know, the peaks and valleys and to ride it because it will bring you where you need to go. And Luke comes to this planet in search of wisdom and knowledge about the force and says, just because the tide is going to take you somewhere doesn't mean that you can't store energy or use it in a particular way, not going against it, but use it to get you where you need to go. Exactly. Right. Like to just because because Alan Watts talks about that, like it doesn't mean that you're passive, that you're just this passive vessel for the universe's energy, right? That you just sit and like, you know, because he always says like, he says people misinterpret when he gets into um, like Mahayana Buddhism and Zen Buddhism. And he's like, people will misinterpret what I'm saying as I just want everybody to leave here and go sit and meditate and be these passive things that never move, right? That just, and he's like, that is, you know, he's like, no, he's like the whole point. It's a, it's a cosmic drama, right? Like that, that, that you've created this thing. And that's a whole other thing we can talk about later. Um, But that, that you can use this energy, right? That, that if you are, uh, but, but the way to use it, the, the in to the universe is not to try and control it. The end of the universe is to understand that you are part of it, to understand that you coexist with it, that you and everyone else do, that you and all living things, right? Mm-hmm. Coexist and coexist with whatever this is that you are calling the force in Star Wars or um, universal energy or, um, you know, the cosmic realm or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. And, in, in real life. And, um, and that, no, you're not just to be a, passive vessel for it you are you know you still go about your day and do things but if you are at one with all of this you understand your place in it and you understand how it works and you understand how you interact with other beings that are in this thing and right that 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 but yes like you're saying it's um very much ken lu's story the tide so wait so another way to think about it too is is um surfing right so uh, if you in the summer turn on the weather channel or you go to the beach, you will see signs everywhere, um, you know, for, uh, tourists and different things and people who haven't spent much, spent much time at the beach, um, stay away from the riptide, right? Stay away from, uh, and, and really all they're talking about is like all that water that's coming in to the, to the shore, right? It's got to go somewhere, right? And so there are these channels that form in the ocean on the beach that oftentimes I don't know in other countries, but I know in America, it's like the leading cause of drowning death every year, right. Is getting pulled out uh, by the riptide, getting pulled out into, um, into the ocean past like where the waves are breaking usually. Right. But people will get in the water and not know how to spot these things. And it's basically, you can see it if you look for it, right. It's just the ocean churning and you will see, and the water just moves from the shore out, right? And what it is, is it's all that water that's banging against the shore has to go somewhere. And so at different points, it just starts, it's like a river and it flows back out, right? Mm-hmm. It'll flow back out. And that's like the leading cause of death is people get caught up in um, that current, that riptide and get pulled out and then drowned because they can't you know, swim that well. And they were just kind of in the water waiting and didn't know what was going on. If you know about it right and i'm like definitely not blaming people for you know getting in in danger in these things but i'm just saying like this goes to the concept of what we're talking about like if you know about it surfers use these things as channels to get to the waves so you don't have to paddle that far right because they kind of set up next to um oftentimes they'll set up next to good breaks or whatever and so it's literally almost like uh taking an elevator if you can spot it and you know about it and it's where, you know, and you, you want to get, you want to get here out to that wave. You can either paddle out there, which is fine. You know, it's what you end up doing most of the time anyway on your board. Or if there, uh, if there's a, a riptide, right. Um, you can, you just kind of ride it out like a conveyor belt literally and save your energy. And it's the same concept. If you are at one with the ocean at one with the tide, you can utilize it 
to your advantage. Well, it kind of, to me, feels a little bit like like the riptide is like the dark side. Like it will draw you in and it will take you over and control and you'll get trapped with it. But that's if, cool. Yeah. If you understand the balance between, hey, I can, you know, tap into this because like the darkness, the shadow, like that's power. It is power. And especially from like a from like a blithe bly perspective the shadow contains all of our passion and power and if we learn how to um incorporate it into ourselves or utilize it and we're not afraid of it that's when we can actually achieve more creativity more push more physicality right because it because mm-hmm. the because the thing is like when artists and um and athletes push into like these deep things that's what pushes them and propels them it's understanding the both of things and that right. things are not just one thing tell me tell me about the circle so he would he would draw a circle on the board right and he would just yeah. say like um he'd say he'd ask the audience he's like you know what do you see Right. And, the, and like, it's important to know, like, like it was just, it was blank. Right. So he yeah, it was just, a blackboard. Cause he often lectured in front of a blackboard. Yeah. Right. And he just yeah. pick up a piece of chalk and like, you know, draw a circle. Like, what do you see? You know, and everybody like a circle, you know, like most of the time that's like, and that's what most people would see. Right. He wasn't asking you to like, really think about it. Just like was giving the example and the thing of like Westerners in particular um, and his audiences were like, you know, it's, it's a circle. You drew a circle. And he would always he'd be like, nope, you know, he's like, what I did was I drew uh, a wall with a hole in it, right? And then he would like, sometimes he would like shade in the area around the circle, right? Mm-hmm. And he would say, he would say like, you know, you can't see that hole without the area around it, right? They mm-hmm. coexist. Does that make sense? Like, Yeah, it's it's much like in art how you don't have content without negative space negative space being like the black yeah. that exists on, yes. a, on a picture he has a, he has a really yeah. cool quote uh, where he talks about how he got into an argument one time with a guy some philosopher or somebody because he was talking about the importance of space and negative space and that um that without one the other can't exist and that most of the time because of how we are set up because of what we do throughout the course of our day like we're only concerned with the thing, right? With with the with the circle. With we're the not goal, with the thing that we're currently focusing on, not right? necessarily everything that is around it. Exactly. We're not concerned with Kylo's upbringing. We're concerned with Kylo and what he's doing right now, and he's killing people, so he needs to be killed, right? Right. We're not concerned with the fact that he was abused his whole life. Exactly. Yeah. Right? That is exactly like. Every time he talks about it, that's like exactly what I think, right? Um, but you know, and he taught and he talks about that and how in Eastern philosophy, those uh the mutual arising is what he calls it, right? And what it's called in Eastern philosophy, I guess. And it's um the idea that one doesn't exist without the other, and it never has, right? To say that to say that um, well, I mean, like. Like to say that to say that the dark exists without the light, it doesn't. Yeah. How did you know it was light unless you had dark to compare it to? Right. Yeah. He goes through this long thing that's really cool. He's like, you know, he's like, these two things can't exist, and and the concept, you know, and I know you agree with me on this, like the the gray Jedi thing, like n- no, right, like, but he says like, uh, in in Eastern philosophy, in um the Tao Te Ching in the I Ching, right? Like uh, um, as an example, you're it's it's either on or off. It's what we base computer systems off of, right? The binary yeah. system, it's either one or the other. And that without the one, the other literally cannot exist on some yeah. level, right? Like it, like he's saying, um, he's saying when people talk about gray, he says to me, no, because to me what what I do is coming from this, right? And 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 this this um, knowing that uh, the non dualist non dualism, right? Like I, um, he says, what I what I do is there's no gray because if you get it down close enough, that gray compared to white would look dark, 
you know, like he said, if you were to get down, yep. right. You know, like, and you're just comparing, right. Like you can compare gray and black. Okay. Do that. Well, no, then you're going to have white and black. The gray is going to look so white. It's going to be light. He's yeah. got this cool. Does that make sense? Right? Yeah, no, it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's making the point like gray doesn't exist. Right. And in, in this thing, and he's like, he says, he's going through this whole deal and he's like gray and white. Well, no, now the gray is black. Right. So like there is no gray. It's really cool anyway, but Buddhism is big on all of this is an illusion. Right. I think yeah. we had a Twitter chat one night and I'm like, Marie Claire, you created Star Wars. Congratulations. Like you don't realize it. Right. You are it. Like you are like you've created all of this stuff. Like and, all of and, this is you. you are the universe. Right. Yeah. Like, and barriers between between concepts is, is actually just, uh, you know, it, it non-existent <laughs> actually. Like say that again. Well, so like I was I actually did a, a massive tweet thread the other day on a canon versus non-canon and how it's uh-huh. like a f- false dichotomy that doesn't need to exist. Like- <laughs> oh, I got to read that. Hinduism, Buddhism being that, like I was saying, that, that you created all this, right? That uh, that this is just uh, like a simulation in your brain. Yes, right? That, that you are it is the big... Are you recording? Alan Watts talks about it as... Uh, he says, you've known this. I love this line. He's, he's, he's talking about babies. And he said, and I've heard Joseph Campbell refer to this too, right? That babies, when um, they start pointing at things and saying that, 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 yeah. right? And Alan Watts, he says, and men, of course, we flatter ourselves and think the child is saying dad, that. What they're really saying is that, that, when they're pointing at things, right? And they realize that they are that, that they've created this. You know this when you were a baby because you haven't been polluted by any kind of thinking yet. You're just there, right? You're mm-hmm. you're literally this perfect thing that is just existing and doesn't have any constructs of society thrown on you yet. You're just there, right? And he's like, and so babies, when they point and they're da, 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 right? He's like, mm-hmm. men flatter ourselves and say, oh, they're saying da, da. And he's like, nope, actually they're much more in tune with the universe than you. And they realize that this is all an illusion that they've created this, right. That, that, um, that these concepts and things are constructs of the mind. Right. And this is a thing he always, he was uh, one of his quotes that I love. He talks when he's talking about Buddhism, getting to Zen Buddhism. uh, He he says, uh, he talks, he says that Buddhism was, uh, Hinduism stripped down for export out of India, right? At the time, like way back, <laughs> right? And then it found its way east and then got mixed with Chinese uh, Taoist thinking and then, you know, became like uh, Zen Buddhism, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but in, in that structure overall for those three, there is a concept of the the mythology of it, I guess, is the easiest way for someone who hasn't like, you know, read about it or been into it, like the the stories behind it. Um, the idea of, uh, the wheel that we're all on, you know, according to Buddhism, um, that we've, we've created, you know, you, you've not, we, we, you've created this, right. You are, you are the universe. Alan Watts talks about how you are it and how, um, kind of as a joke, you know, he's like, uh, in the Western world, if someone were to stand up and say, I'm God, right, you would obviously be considered crazy. And, you know, if you were to go around professing you were God and he says, um, in certain parts of uh, the East, if you stand up and say, I'm God, someone will inevit- inevitably say, congratulations, at last you found out, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Unless you, know. you realized it, yes. <laughs> yeah. And and that that you have created all this because it's a game you're playing with yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. And so he's got all this, all of these lectures that are really cool to listen to that talk about the concept of that and um, where it comes from, uh, you know, in, in Hinduism and Buddhism and on down into uh, Zen Buddhist thinking, but that once you really become one with the universe and you are mindful of your existence, then you realize, uh, he says he's he loves a quote from 
um, William James that says the word I is a noun of position like this or here, Mm -hmm. right? That, that I, the ego is just that this you that you've constructed that, uh, in the Western world that Alan always talks about, you know, he says, you got to get out of this thinking that, that you're this, this ooey gooey soul thing wrapped up in a bag of skin, you know, that like, yeah. um, that that somehow and then somehow that thing inside you is is natural and you know by nature wrong and dirty and needs to be cleansed or whatnot that that you are you know and he's coming from this i have to say he comes from this like i was saying as an episcopal priest right like he um mm-hmm. he he does some really cool stuff where he he talks about jesus in terms of like uh almost as a Buddhist. Right. And he like had gotten a lot of trouble for this kind of, you know, That's um, so funny. My dad used to talk about how, uh, Jesus and Buddha were, he felt like the same story. Mm-hmm. Right. Interesting. That's so no, it, interesting. It is. It's in, and, and he talks a lot about, um, about that. And that's what I like, like I, going back to, to it, like, that's what I love about him is that he has, he has that background, right. Of being raised in the Western world and, and gone to, you know, having a degree in uh, theology. And I think he even went to seminary if I'm not mistaken, but he was an Episcopal priest. And like, so he has that background, right. And he, he, he can very easily compare those things and um, extrapolate some really cool stuff from them. And another quote from him directly from Alan Watts is, you know, he loves to say, I is the universe aware of itself at a particular place in time. Right. Yeah. That the, really the that really reminds me of uh Yoda, right? Like, um, you know, there is no difference in the force, the rock, the tree, the ship, you like mm-hmm. only different in your mind. Yes. Big right? Time. Because it's the construct that we put on on, you know, on the universe. And um one of my favorite a sort of science-based phenomenon. And this is going to be my like plug into the the whole idea that we are one is mm-hmm. when astronauts go to the International Space Station, they experience something called the overview effect, mm-hmm. which is that they uh, go up there and they are, you know, taken apart from the world and they suddenly see the big blue ball in amongst this um sea of black basically and realize that there is no difference between anything that exists on the planet we are all part of the planet and we had better take care of it and there is a massive spiritual moment that every astronaut goes through when they look down at the earth and realize that this is our home and basically spaceship earth it exists within the nothingness of space and that we are all in this together. And if you can take a moment and view the world as not just you, but you and the world together, both at the same time, you Mm -hmm. can start to think in this like manner that which you resonate more strongly with not just the world, the galaxy, the universe, like you are one with the universe. Yeah. Both and that at the and, same time, and that's so cool because that goes to, um, I mean, that goes to everything I was saying, and like we were talking about, and it, but it also goes to, uh, to bring up Campbell. He Campbell in uh, the Inner Reaches of Outer Space talks about this big time. He's got the four functions of mythology, right? And his argument was throughout most of his work and defined really well in this particular book, and it comes from a speech he gave that Robert Bly was there with him. And, um, but he was basically saying like Campbell was famous for, you know, that we need to update our mythology and he's, you know, his four functions of mythology were number one, that you're mystified by this thing, right. That this thing, whatever it is, it's like the aesthetic arrest principle, right? Like it's so cool, right? Like the first time I saw star Wars, right? Like what was it that like, wow, just wowed you about it. Right. And mm-hmm. that the second function of mythology, um, was cosmological that that your mythology or the mythologies throughout time have tried to make sense of the world around you right obviously right some of these things are like kind of a duh when you think about it but he he ordered them and kind of put them into the structure and then the second 
or sorry, the third was um, uh, sociological, right? That it, it affects and has a way of, of ordering your culture or the immediate things around you, right? Other people as they interact with the mythology. And then four, that ultimately it ends up affecting you, right? Psycholo- it's, it's become psychological. And then Campbell's argument was that we are stuck on number two. Our mythology in the Western world is still trying to explain something from 2000 years ago, right? That we never were able to update it because kings and dare I say it, the patriarchy took over. And seriously, he talks about this, right? Like, and wouldn't we never allowed, we were never allowed to move past the mythology of the time, right? And so then in this book, he, he, he argues that maybe, maybe the East got it right. Maybe we uh, should, at the time, this is the other thing, good old Joe. Um, he like has a couple sentences where he's railing against, you know, the commies and, <laughs> and you're like, you know, okay, yeah, Bless whatever. Bless his cotton socks. I, That's what you're oh, I know, to say. right? Yeah. Um, but anyway, and Watts talks about this too, that, and this is where the whole, his thing when he loved Campbell's uh, Into the Forest paper, but they both kind of start to argue for at certain points, uh, maybe update to, the, to our mythology in the Western world. And they both kind of push, especially Alan Watts, more of a, they don't push, but um, it's why Alan did what he did, right? Like, here's another one. Look how this works. And so if you take what you just said about the astronauts, right? And about what we know about science today, and there's other things you can go to for this, right? Actual science with, um, you can do some really cool stuff with uh, uh, quantum physics, and string theory and um, the fact that uh, have you heard in people, and I know people who are scientists may be listening to this. I, I, I know that this gets talked about quite a bit and it's not the exact representation, but you've heard of uh, like the quantum, when people talk about string Qu- theory and quantum, quantum entanglement physics, to do. Yes. Photons? Yes. Quantum entanglement. I yes, can talk that, about this. Okay, cool. Awesome. Because, but, but the, but you know, you know, the experiment they did where they, they found out that literally you observing something yes. has an effect on it, right? Yes. Like, like literally, yes. And so, so like you, if you try to observe, uh, sorry, if you try to observe a photon mm-hmm. behaving like a particle, it, it won't. Right. <laughs> It'll stay as a wave. If mm-hmm. you try to, it'll stay as a what I as, love. Like this is what I love. This wave. is what I love is that you you went from the atom like that we thought. Yeah. Oh no, the atoms the light, and you're like, oh no, there's these. Uh, there's what? Ah, yeah. there's waves. Yes. Yeah. So All right, go ahead. so photons both will behave as a particle and as a wave, but as soon as you start to observe the, you know, the light, and as soon as you're like, hey, I need it to behave in a particular way, it will just do the thing that it, it was doing before. Mm-hmm. It, it won't allow you to see it kind of change states or to do what you want it to do in that moment. It doesn't behave the way that you want it to do. It's going to do its own, it's going to do its own thing. And that's where the, you know, whole thought experiment that Schrodinger did to do with uh, the cat in the box and people are very famously know about the cat in the box and like, the, but they don't understand exactly what it means, which mm-hmm. is to do with quantum entanglement. If you put a cyanide pill or a capsule in the box with the cat, if the box is closed, the cat is both dead and alive at the same time until you open the box and reveal the truth. And so that's a lot like the universe when it comes to things is that things are both alive and dead (laughs) at the same time we as humans time is a construct right Mm -hmm. we are both alive and dead if we remove time from the equation Mm -hmm. yeah that's what it's trying to say is that the very act of trying to place it in a in a point in time will but you can't observe it being both but the goal is to understand that things are actually both. And yes. And then you observing it has an actual effect, right? Yes. Are getting that right? Like 
the very act of you observing something, which, yes. which what I'm trying to do is go back to Campbell's four functions of mythology, right? So what plays better with that cosmology that, that we know as scientific truth now, right? What plays better? The Eastern view of you created all this, right? This is all you're doing. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, they, like, cause Alan Watts even talks about in here at certain times, uh, things that were going on in the sixties with, uh, quantum physics, right. And that a better mythology might just be a better, you know, a better story to understand this might just be that, you know, a story that has you as, I mean, there's no other way to say it. You as the universe, you, you are, I mean, that's what he talks about. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very hard. I know I, I would, I would hear that and I'd go, oh, okay, I get it. But I didn't till I kept hearing it and I kept going over and over what he was getting at as far as not just you are it, but being one with all of it, right? Mm-hmm. That, that, that in these mythologies and these Eastern ways of thinking, you know, like he, he says like a, a, a Buddhist monk or a Zen master, like if you came up and had you know, problems and were, you know, like, oh, I really want to get into Zen. Like, I need it. I need it. I, he said they would look at you and they'd be like, oh, Shiva, come off it. Right. Like, mm-hmm. I know what you're trying to do. Like, <laughs> you know, like he's like, you're, they would look at you and think, wow, this person has really gone out of their way to construct this huge drama to make their life so interesting. Right. That like yeah. they've got all these issues that they think are issues and like it's all you're doing. Honey, you've <laughs> like you've you've done it to yourself, right? You've like built the con- constructs by which the universe behaves. Yes, right. Yeah, and so take that way of thinking, right? Take that idea that that you you are the one that has constructed this. That you, in a sense, if you think about the experiment we were talking about in physics, like Mm -hmm. the observer has an effect on what's being observed, right? That then take that and and put it in terms of star Wars. When, when Obi-Wan sees Qui-Gon or in that case, when anybody sees a force ghost, Uh, this is from a certain point of view, which was the collection of short stories uh, that all take place around a new hope. And, it's just, it's like my favorite. It's, it is actually my favorite Star Wars story. I have it signed by Claudia Gray because I love it so much. But um, this is this is the moment by which Qui-Gon Jinn is appearing to Obi-Wan Kenobi in, in the desert of Tatooine. Um, Luke has just kind of gone off to go and find the homestead. But um, no place is barren of the Force. And they who are one with the force can always find the possibility of life. Awareness precedes consciousness. The warmth is luxuriated in and drawn upon before the mind is cognizant of doing so. Next comes the illusion of linear time. Only then does a sense of individuality arise. Remembrance of what was and what is. A knowledge of one's self as separate from the force it provides a vantage point for the experiencing the physical world in its complexity and ecstasy and the pain of that separation is endurable only because unity will come once again and soon that fracture from all that fracture from the all that memory of temporal existence is most easily summed up with the word the fracture was once called by the name Qui Gon. That's so cool. Yeah, right. It's the best. It's the best. I mean, think about it, right? Like, it's it's like, where's the best place to be? <laughs> One with the Force, right? Like, it's it's painful to be separated from it. The pain of that separation is endurable only because unity will come again. Yeah. So right? being a Force ghost is painful because you are separate from from the One. From being one with everything, right? And why do you, why do you come? Why are you why are you a force ghost? Because Obi Wan's called you. Yes. Right. Because he said your name, and and you're like a fracture from the all. Like so, so the universe, the force, right? When and this is how I think about it. This is what I like have gone down rabbit holes with. Um, 
to a big one that I'll get to in a minute. But um, so it's to me, it's like when Obi Wan's one, he doesn't have to. I mean, he says his name, right? But it, that that's kind of the point where it brings Qui Gon like fully, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then is it is? And I'm thinking, isn't it in this story where he says something to Qui Gon? He's like, "You're nearly corporeal." Like he's yeah. So later on, as he's been there a while and they've been talking, right? Is Obi Wan's interacting with basically the universe, this thing that he remembers as Qui Gon Jinn, right? The more he remembers it, the more he interacts with it. Um, later, like a couple pages later in the story, Obi Wan nods, enough reassured to focus fully on Qui Gon. You're very nearly corporeal. I've never seen you appear like this, right? Like it's like the more he's he's thinking of him, the more he needs him to be there. The more Qui Gon is there, the more he's like pulled pulled this thing that was Qui Gon, the fracture, right? pulled it back out of the force, pulled it like into existence. Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you know what I mean? Yep. Like, and, and I say that because um, going back to what you said, how Claudia Gray said, listen to Alan Watts and, you know, read the Tao Te Ching. Um, Alan Watts has a, um, a lecture where he, he, he talks about um, from his Western point of view as an Episcopal priest, the moment when uh, Jesus at the Last Supper, right? He says, what does Jesus say? Do this in remembrance of me, right? And he said, you can go uh, to any church on Sunday and, you know, communion. And I rem- like, I remember as growing up as a Lutheran, like, it, I remember it was such a big deal to me being young and like, because we were told like in catechism, right, which is pretty much the equivalent of like, um, in Catholicism, what am I trying to say? I don't, I don't like when you go, when you go through before you, like, I know as Lutheran, like I I couldn't go to communion until I had gone through like this class. First communion. Yes. Yeah. Isn't there catechism? Is that, is okay. It's just Lutheran, Lutherans and okay. We're weird. Whatever. (laughs) Um, So like the sacraments in, in, in Catholicism are first communion, uh, Mm -hmm. the first like, you know, confession and then uh, confirmation. Which is like you're officially Confirm- like, Yeah, okay. See, yeah. this is how far removed I am from all this. Now. Like, <laughs> um, but when I was young, I remember going to catechism, like classes, right? Like you had to go through all this stuff um for like a year and then you could have your first communion, you know, whatever. And yeah. um and so and it was confirmation, it was a big deal. Um it was all at the same time, yeah. Yeah. And but I remember like as Lutherans, one of the like tenets that they pounded into our head was that when you eat of the bread and drink of the wine that that is literally Jesus's blood and body. Yeah. Right. And I remember as a kid, just going like asking a million questions, like, okay. <laughs> like how is like, this? Am I, re- like you're saying, you know, and, and like, you know, anyway, getting in trouble and the question skirted or whatnot. But my point is with this is that Alan talks about that very particular thing in Catholicism in certain parts of Christianity, right. That are close to, cause Lutheranism is just one step removed from, yeah. you know, right. Um, and, and he says when for him, right. Looking at it now with the Eastern mindset and having left the church when he did, he's like, he's like, th- he's like, think about it this way. Think about when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Right. Mm-hmm. And at this point in the lecture, and at this point, you're just supposed to know all this other stuff like we just talked about, that you are the universe in Eastern philosophy, that you have created all this, right? Da, 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 da. And it goes with this story of Qui-Gon, right? And Obi-Wan and Master and Apprentice when he calls him out of the force, basically. So Alan Watts says, when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, he's like, what if he was just saying, whenever you all get together, what you're really doing is remembering me, mm-hmm. Right. And everybody's like, oh, yeah. And he says, no, listen to what I'm saying. What you're really doing is remembering. You're membering. You're literally piecing me back together. Mm. Right. And then he goes into this thing and he's like, now think about this in terms of what we've been talking about with uh, you've created the universe. Right. When someone goes in, when someone dies, they're not really dead. They've just become one with this thing you've created, right? You don't need them anymore on your life journey, right? 
-hmm. You might think you do, but you as you that's created all this, you've let them go. And you're going to do this thing where you, you know, grieve for them or whatnot, right? And in this, I have to say, like, I am not, obviously, I, I, I am not um, dissuading putting down someone who's in grief right now. Or like, you know what I mean? Like, th this is all a concept. I'm not saying this is, does that make sense? Because I don't, mm -hmm. like. No, but, it's it's hard, right? Like, and and you come, like, that's part of the, like, the grieving and the remembrance and what people go through with funerals is to like yes. help and it's a very real thing that we all have to go through and i don't want to make it seem like it's not i'm just like playing with star wars and alan watts you know what i mean yeah. like i but but he says like so you know think about it in terms of and now when you need that person again and and this is the thing because alan watts can seem very depressing at times if you're listening to him you can be like dude really but he always kind of brings it back if you're paying attention, you know, and he's like, when you need that person again, when you remember somebody, right. When, um, I don't know if you've seen the, the movie Coco. The little kid. Uh, yeah. It's awesome. Right. Yeah. And, the, and, and think about in terms of like various cultures that have like, uh, I know when we lived in Alaska, right. Like, um, uh, in the little native village, um, they were, they were big on once a year having a uh, feast for um, family members who had died. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's a really cool thing to think about that when you get together with friends and family to remember somebody like that, like that you are literally re remembering them, yeah. that they literally might be there with you. If you're, if you're really going to buy into this, this concept, right. That like you're, you know, you're doing like Obi-Wan did, right. You're like, if, if in this story, like, you're going to pull that person back out of what they've gone into, mm -hmm. right? Because you need them then at that moment for whatever reason, right? And then it becomes, at least to me, then it becomes comforting to think, oh, if somebody's gone, like Luke says, no one's ever really gone. They're mm -hmm. just, they've just become in Star Wars language, one with the force. And but they're never gone. They're never gone, right? And so if, if you're strong in the force, which you don't have to be a Skywalker to do. No. Um, <laughs> if, if you're strong in the force, if you're one with the Tao, if you're one with the way, this way of thinking, right? This idea that of there all is, of us The, the are, separation is only in your mind. Yeah, right? And like, you can go back to that can, time when you needed that person. Well, not even that time. Like you can, yeah. you can pull them back out of the force. You can, they can be there, right? Like if you're mm -hmm. strong in the force, if you're strong in this, this idea that, you know, that we're all together in this, that you're all one. And it, it's funny because you like, you get to a point, at least I do, where you don't even like to use the word death. You're like, that word doesn't really fit for me. And Alan Watts yeah. talks about that too. Like, you know, like you're, you've been taught these words and this, this thing called language. And, you know, if you don't want to use it, you don't have to, you know, like as crazy as that sounds like it's all a construct you've been thrown into. and and if you want to remember somebody, you can literally put them back together, right? You can remember them. You can get them there. And I love that idea. And I love that part of Master and Apprentice because it's obvious she listened to Alan Watts a lot. And, you know, it, it, it seeps through in that to me, like when, when, he's, when he's pulling him out and the fact that Qui-Gon is like Qui-Gon still a uh, Qui Gon's still Qui Gon. Like he had, mm -hmm. like it hurts him to come out of this, right? And the only thing that makes it not hurt is that he knows he's going to be able to go back to it once Obi Wan's done with him. You know what I mean? Or, yeah, the way yeah, it, yeah, right? yeah. It's like, okay, dude, you need me again. What? What is it? Like, there's a oh, whole level of like Bodhisattva stuff going on too. Like you, yeah. you know, like that these people are um, Bodhisattvas, and so they can't leave until all of the suffering of the galaxy is done. Mm -hmm. And I, like we could get into that in a, in some future conversation. But yeah, yeah the idea is that it, there is no separation, right? And the separation only exists because your mind has limited it itself. Yeah. And I think that the the goal is to get to a point through meditation or through mindfulness or through whatever, whatever works for you. I like to think about the force. It actually helps me center myself is to think, okay, things are both, you know? Things are both. Yeah. Like in that I am myself, 
but I am also the universe. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. And that, Alan that Watts talks me. about that too. Yeah. yeah. He talks about that. He says, when I say this, he says, he says, I'm not saying again, like, it's kind of like we were saying before, you don't have to be this passive vessel. You don't have to then think, Oh yeah, I'm one with the force. Okay. Like, great. So I'm just this thing moving around in it. Like, no, it's like you can play with this in your head. Like you can be both, like you're saying, you know, like you can be part of the cosmic force and the living force because those two things exist. And some people might consider them a duality, but they're the same because without one, the other could not exist. Just like the light and the dark, male and female. Exactly. Because they are ready. Yeah. <laughs> Odd that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I think we got where we needed to go, which is that uh, the flow and how we exist is actually part of the journey. And the journey is to exist and understand that you are part of everything. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Can I give you one more? But when I said I, w I went down holes with this, um, looking back at Star Wars, and I know this is like my head cannon, but sure, there's a way that's real that I love that that when you play with this idea, right? Um, in Star Wars world, there's a way you can look at to me the scene in Return of the Jedi when Luke and Leia are when Leia, when Leia finds out she's his sister, right? When they're in mm -hmm. the Ewok trees and right before he leaves to go let himself get captured so he can, you know, be taken to the emperor with Vader. And um, he asks Leia, he says, do you remember your mother? Right. Yeah. And immediately. So my head, I'm like, you, this is so cool. And I think about like, if something were to happen to my wife and I, like, you know, like our, like our kids. And I think about, like I was just saying, like in, in Coco and different things, like when you get together with your family, right. Even just the physical presence of you being together to me hints at you're remembering your parents, you're remembering because you wouldn't exist without them. Right. Yeah. You wouldn't exist without them. So when I look at that scene in return of the Jedi, now I know that that's probably, well, let's face it. That's not what was intended, but it's a neat way. It's like, you're like, it's a lens of Alan Watts. It's a lens to look through to view star Wars. So to me now, when Luke and Leia, or when Luke asks Leia, do you remember your mother? She says, you know, I forget exactly, but she's like very little, right? Already. If you're going to follow this with me down this rabbit hole and this concept, what are the two of them doing? They're, putting Padme back together, mm -hmm. right? And there's there, a way... And and uh, like just from a mythological perspective, that's actually what happens when Isis puts Osiris yes, back Isis, together. Yes. Isis... I knew, I knew you would go there. I knew you... <laughs> Isis collects the pieces of, of Osiris from around Egypt. And to bring him back together, she re-remembers who he is. But she re... re she remembers him differently because that's part of the transformation is that you can never really be who you were before, right? right? You can only be who you're going to be. Yeah. Yeah. But there's a way you can look at that scene then in Return of the Jedi, like that, that then they're, they're remembering Padme, right? They're putting her back together and that it's not just Luke that gets Vader to, you know, to turn back that in, in, in some sense, it's, it's Padme. She's there somehow, right? Because her kids remembered her. Because <laughs> Luke even uses Padme's words, right? Like, we didn't know that at the time. Right. You know, when I was 10 watching There's it still in good Amarillo, in Texas. Yes, right? Yes. Like, it's, it's yeah. really cool. It's a really cool way to think about it. That And, and that good on George for making that tie back to say, you know, the, the Force is speaking through Luke and reminding Vader you know, of, yeah. of the similarities between Padme and Luke mm -hmm. and the similarities between, you know, this other person, this, this woman out there that is the sister. Yes. yes. And the whole, the whole no scream is the same as, you know, the end of Revenge of the Sith. Like, yeah, 
Like you it's know. all just kind of replaying in his mind and he has an opportunity to to not do things the way that he did them before. Yeah. And George is pretty cool. I'm George just, is George is such a good well, good boy. Them pretty cool <laughs> trilogies. They get they're pretty neat. And they're but. pretty awesome. <laughs> it it went where it needed to go. Very true. Very true. I'm yes. excited to talk more about Alan. I got a lot more stuff. I'll be more with it next time. I guess the like that's the point. That's the whole point. Yeah, it's it, there's always going to be more, but this helps us think about the force and how, especially heading into a very f- force centric period that we're going to be going into with the High Republic stuff being tackled. Right. You know, it's important for us to lay some groundwork on how people can appreciate it and understand what is being said when things are being said, like you know, listening watching the clone wars episodes that have just come out um Mm -hmm. like we definitely hear a different version of the force than a dogmatic uh jedi centric version coming from ahsoka right so it's more in line with this flow idea right? right she is no jedi and it's really interesting to say that i love it when she says that it's so cool you know I, and and this is part of her road of trials that she's on to understand what that truthfully means. And then we get her post rebels, and potentially we'll get more stories after that, which is really really exciting to me. Mm-hmm. That would be cool. Yeah. All right, Joshua. <laughs> <laughs> Where can people find you online? And you'll be back for more Alan Watts talk as soon as we can I, schedule some time. I will. Uh, yes, I will. Um, people can find me at Joshua V Johnson on twitter that's where i am existing if i'm not at one with the force existing in the universe (laughs) or existing all at the same time (laughs) yeah there is no difference between you me the podcast hey everybody congratulate yourselves if you've been paying attention to this you can go down the rabbit hole like i told marie claire a few months ago on twitter we were having a conversation like congratulate yourself you created star wars (laughs) <laughs> you are also George Lucas. Yes. Uh, you take care until next time. All right. Cheers. You too. Thanks. Thank you for listening to What the Force. I'm Marie Claire Gould, your host. Our music is orchestral music composed by Christy Carew for What the Force. We have a Patreon at patreon.com slash what the force. We'd like to thank all our patrons, especially those who love and are obsessed with What the Force. Melody, Night Huntress, In Wild Space, Susan, Brad, Anna Perez, Macau Mom, Neil, and James. Make sure you like and subscribe on your podcast app of choice or on YouTube. Leaving a five-star review on iTunes helps other people find the show. You can connect with us on Twitter at What The Force Show, What The Force Podcast on Facebook, or on our website, whattheforce.ca. We also have a new Discord. Links are available in the liner notes. Feel free to reach out and start a conversation. Cheers.